8th September 1944, Queen Mary. We have been traveling in the Gulf Stream all day and consequently living in a Turkish bath of hot clamminess. We began with the short COS chief of staff and at 12 noon had a meeting lasting till 1.30 with the PM. He looked old, unwell, and depressed, evidently found it hard to concentrate and kept holding his head between his hands. He was quite impossible to work with, began by accusing us of framing up against him and of opposing him in his wishes. According to him, we were coming to Quebec solely to obtain twenty landing ships out of the Americans to carry out an operation against Istria, coast of Slovenia, parenthetically, to seize Trieste, and there we were suggesting that with the rate at which events were moving, Istria might be of no value. War Diaries, Allenbrook, page 589. 9 September, 1944, Queen Mary. We received two minutes from the PM today, which show clearly that he is a sick man. His arguments are again centered on one point, Istria. We have come for one purpose only, to secure landing craft for an operation against Istria! Exclamation point, exclamation point. All else of important fades into the shade of secondary considerations. We had another meeting with Winston at twelve noon. He was again in a most unpleasant mood. Produced the most ridiculous arguments to prove that operations could be speeded up so as to leave us an option till December before having to withdraw any forces from Europe! Exclamation point. He knows no details has only got half the picture in mind, talks absurdities, and makes my blood boil to listen to his nonsense. I find it hard to remain civil, and the wonderful thing is that three-quarters of the population of the world imagine that Winston Churchill is one of the strategists of history, a second Marlborough, and the other one quarter have no conception what a public menace he is, and has been throughout this war! Exclamation point. It is far better that the world should never know, and never suspect the feet of clay of that otherwise superhuman being. Without him England was lost for a certainty. With him England has been on the verge of disaster time and again. War Diaries, Allenbrook, page 590. 13 September, 1944, Quebec. Started with a COS, Chief of Staff, at 9 a.m., as we were to meet the Americans at 10 a.m. However, the PM sent for us and informed us it was essential for him to see us at 10 a.m. As a result, we had to put off our meeting with the Americans. However, when we met him, we found he had nothing special to see us about! Exclamation point. I would have given a great deal to tell him what I thought of him. At 11.30 we had a plenary meeting, which consisted of a long statement by the PM, giving his views as to how the war should be run. According to him, we had two main objectives. First, an advance on Vienna. Secondly, the capture of Singapore! Exclamation point. War Diaries, Allenbrook, page 591 and 2. Stalin had refused to attend the Casablanca Conference in North Africa in January of 1943, saying that the Battle of Stalingrad required his presence. And FDR used the term unconditional surrender that he got from General Grant, who had used it in the American War between the states. And FDR insisted on there being no chance of a separate peace with Germany, despite the advice given by his CIA man, Alan Dulles. To explain his unconditional surrender commitment to the American people, FDR went on the radio on the 12th of February in 1943 after the Casablanca Conference, and the word Casablanca in Spanish meant White House. Hitler had gone into Yugoslavia in April of 1941 to chase out the British, and Yugoslavia was where Churchill was pursuing his obsession with Europe's soft underbelly, and Hitler also needed to help the Italians in Greece and in Albania, because Hitler had to keep the Italians on his side if he were ever to find the Pope's gold. The British were helping communists in Serbia who were ethnic friends of Russia, and they were fighting Mikhailovich's militias who were at war with both the Nazis and the communists, and Mikhailovich and his Chetniks only wanted his country to remain sovereign and free. 
the British were helping the communist partisans in Yugoslavia, and that way the British would know where all the supplies and soldiers were as soon as the separate peace with Germany went through. And as the British joined the German army to obliterate the Russians, all the communists in Yugoslavia could be ambushed and that would leave Churchill in complete possession of Yugoslavia. After the Italians dropped out of the war, a separate peace for Britain would have seen America joined with Russia to fight against Germany and England and Japan, and that would have been a formidable struggle indeed. So the atom bomb dropped on Japan had saved the planet from a truly gargantuan fight when Britain had once again turned on its allies in the middle of a war to fight alongside the enemy, a tactic that had brought them such enormous success in the past. It might not have worked, though, because Churchill had underestimated the resolve of the U Yugoslav partisans willing to fight for Tito. And the Russian victory at Kursk in July of 1943 brought a dead stop to the British plans for the Balkans. Eddie Rickenbacker went to Russia in the fall of 1943 after their triumph at Kursk. And Rickenbacker came back with the conclusion that the Russians really wanted to embrace capitalism and become a democracy. When the Russians started to win their part of Hitler's war, and the Americans began to win against the Japanese, the Germans' V-1 rockets were unleashed on London to make Hitler look like a monster and force the Americans to see that a separate peace with Germany was the only solution in the face of such inhuman weapons. The V-1 rockets were being launched from right across the street from where British spy headquarters in the Netherlands had set up a special suite to accommodate a meeting with Himmler. For four years, the Gestapo had searched desperately for a man this convent concealed. There, behind the sitting room of the scabrous old building built at the juncture of a vacant lot and the high stone walls of the insane asylum of St. Anne, was the headquarters of Jade Amical, the head of British intelligence for occupied France. Protected by these old stones and the tw tranquil courage of a handful of nuns, his headquarters had survived all the Gestapo's relentless hunts. Is Paris burning? Page 3 to 4. The footnote read, In 1943 the convent was even the site of a secret meeting between Admiral Wilhelm Canaris, head of the Abwehr, Germany's military intelligence, who was taken there blindfolded, and the chief of the intelligence service in France. Canaris wanted to find out from Churchill what might be the terms of an eventual peace treaty between the Allies and a Germany free of Hitler. A fervent dream of Admiral Canaris shared by Hitler had been getting the shipyards at the port of Danzig back, and Speer had worked out the math that the tunnels and factories and defenses he'd been building should have allowed the Germans to beat the whole world into submission, but during Barbarossa, Russian soldiers were surrendering in such huge numbers that they had begun starving to death at the rate of 50%, and the peasants who were supposed to help feed them had been burning their farms and retreating towards Leningrad. Soviet POWs, who could have been used as the, at the forced labor camps in Germany, were being held out in the open behind barbed wire, and the exposure and lack of water alone was killing them before they started to starve to death. German personnel, required to supervise the prisoners Speer had figured would be dying on the battlefield, were draining resources away from the offensive, and Speer's math quickly fell by the wayside. It wasn't so much that the workers were dying of disease and starvation, but that so many were being intentionally murdered without even coming close to being put behind barbed wire, and that news had quickly spread among the Russian peasantry that Speer had been counting on to help feed both their Russian POW countrymen and the plundering German army. As millions of Russian soldiers were dying at the hands of the Germans during Barbarossa, 
The British said it was impossible to invade Normandy to deflect some of the German forces, not only from a lack of landing craft, but from the threat of German U-boats. So the Americans invented depth charges and sonar and sonar, and sent most of the U-boats to the bottom of the sea. And FDR suggested in the spring of 1943 that it was time to land in Europe and go get Hitler. The British said they did not want to use any of their ships in a Normandy D-Day landing because there might be more U-boats out there. So FDR told Mr. Higgins to start building America's own boats and ordered Ike to prepare to invade England. The impetus against going along with the timetable being proposed by the British came suddenly that April of 1943 when FDR demanded an explanation for the British Operation Mincemeat. The body of a British Royal Marine officer had washed up on the coast of Spain, with a briefcase shackled to his wrist, and the briefcase contained letters that mentioned military plans written by Mountbatten himself. And the letters described a British landing in Sardinia in vague terms, although the recipient of the letters would have known known precisely what he meant. And the briefcase had been immediately sent to Hitler, who responded by moving troops into Greece. The letters said that the Sicily landing was just a diversion, and when FDR read the letters, he thought they were authentic. And FDR did not believe the British claim that the contents of the briefcase were clever and intentional forgeries, crafted to deceive the Germans in this mincemeat operation. The British claimed that the reference to a British landing that involved sardines did not mean an invasion of Greece, but really meant Sardinia. But even Hitler figured it out. The washed-up body also had theater tickets in its pocket and a letter from his bank, giving him one last warning to pay his overdrawn account or the bank would quote take necessary steps. Close quote. And another letter said he was no longer welcome at a club until he paid his dues. And the British told FDR that all these documents had been forged and that they had also faked the picture of his girlfriend, even though she was telling a different story altogether. The British said that mincemeat had been a trick to make the Germans think the British were going to invade Sardinia and not Sicily, and they claimed to have kept several corpses on ice for months in order to jettison a body from a submarine with a briefcase chained to its wrist that was sure to wash up on a certain beach, and then it would immediately be reported and forwarded to Hitler. The British even produced photographs of corpses dressed in British officer uniforms and wearing inflatable life vests, and they said the ocean currents had been carefully mapped so that he would land on the beach in a specific place after floating for days at sea, uneaten by sharks, just to plant these phony letters that would end up on Hitler's desk. The body was found almost to Gibraltar, from where it had parted ways with the sub. And from testimony of those who had been on board the submarine, apparently a gunfight had broken out between the haughty naval officer and the submarine crew after he had ordered them to run a U-boat gauntlet through the Strait of Gibraltar. They had just been strafed by the Luftwaffe while cruising in Spanish waters, and they'd been at sea for ten days and were in no mood to argue with him. And when the British naval officer made some smart remarks to the crew, a fight had broken out. And when the body was picked up by a fisherman, it had been in the water for four or five days, and the Spanish medical examiner determined that he had still been alive when thrown overboard because water was in his lungs. The British claimed the letters were fake, but Mountbatten, Mountbatten had written in one of them that this naval officer with the briefcase chained to his wrist was being sent because he was so trustworthy, and that he was trusted for being "quote unquote" more accurate than most about the Dieppe fiasco. And the letter said that he had been ordered to assist with some plans involving barges and equipment in Scotland. After the body was discovered by the Spanish fishermen on the beach, cables were sent to Berlin with all the details, and the British bombed their own submarine from which he had come, and then set up the Americans to take the blame. 
The British goaded some American pilots into bombing that submarine by saying that submarines were unstoppable, and the American pilot said, No, no, no problem. We can see them underwater on good days and don't need them to come up to periscope depth. And the Americans scored a direct hit in the Bay of Biscay on what they'd been told was a German U boat. And the British had even given them a picture of the submarine that was needed to be disappeared. But the sub was merely damaged, and many of the crew escaped to tell the tale. Mincemeat had also included the sinking of the Italian cruiser Trieste, that had an Italian, that had an Italian peace delegation on board, and they had been intended to meet with the British after the assassination of Hitler on the thirteenth of the thirteenth of March. Even though that attempt on Hitler had failed. And at one thirty seven PM on the tenth of April in nineteen forty three, twenty four B seventeens dropped six one thousand pound bombs each on the Italian Trieste ship from eighteen thousand seven hundred and fifty feet, which was an accuracy they would not be able to duplicate again, and no anti aircraft fire had come from the Italians. Italy had joined with Germany to keep the British out of the Italian territory of Libya, and Turkey sided with Germany under the table, and whoever ruled Turkey controlled the luc lucrative opium trade. Both the Germans and the British weren't after the oil in Romania so much as they were after the opium in the Balkans because they needed to replace the morphine they had stockpiled for a shorter war, and Hitler's war had been interfering with transports from India. Turkey had stayed neutral while the British were setting up the communists in Yugoslavia, and Churchill secured an agreement at the Tehran conference in December of 1943 that the Allies would sign only with the communist partisans in Yugoslavia rather than the American-friendly Chetniks, and the British were bound and determined to stick to their Balkan plans, even though it meant abandoning the hundreds of American airmen who'd been shot down while bombing the Ploesti oil fields, airmen who were being sheltered and fed by the Chetniks, and the story is not for the faint of heart, and can be found in the book The Forgotten Five Hundred, the untold story of the men who risked all for the greatest rescue mission of World War II, by Gregory A. Freeman, New York, New American Library, Penguin Group, 2007. The invasion of Greece would begin the launch of Churchill's Balkan invasion to secure Yugoslavia for Britain, and the plan had included turning the Americans into mincemeat in Italy, and eight years after the war, the British would publish a book about mincemeat called The Man Who Never Was by Montague, the same name of the man who had started the Bank of England that had begun the House of Hanover, and the British sealed all mincemeat files until 2036. Churchill had been obsessed with the Yugoslavia operation, and he continually suggested that British troops be withdrawn from the Normandy theater and sent to Trieste, and he wanted American troops withdrawn from Italy and sent to France to replace them, just as Marlborough Churchill had proposed in 1706. But it was more than just the Balkans and Yugoslavia in Churchill's scheme, and that would become apparent at the end of the war, as his focus narrowed specifically to intend the lovely port of Trieste. Because Italy had been fighting the Turkish Moslems in 1911, and that had turned into the Great War when Britain and France joined in, the Italians had seized German boats in Italian harbors and were given Trieste and Trentino as a reward in the Versailles Treaty. 1 May 1944 The crumbling of Germany is fast. Forces in Germany may surrender to Alex tomorrow. At the same time, Bernadotte is carrying on negotiations with Himmler. The end must come soon. War Diaries, Allenbrook, page 685 5 May 1944. Another flood of telegrams necessitated our having a Saturday COS chief of staff meeting. The telegrams were mainly concerned with Alexander's difficulties with Tito, about Trieste, etc. War Diaries, Allenberg, page 687. 
Austria had built a railroad from Trieste to Vienna in 1857 through the upper part of Yugoslavia. And Trieste had been under Austria's protection since the Hundred Years' War, and Trieste had flourished under Maria Theresa and was called the Austrian Riviera. Three times Napoleon had occupied Trieste, and it had been returned to Austria at the Congress of Vienna. And when Hitler's war ended, a special area in the Austrian mountains was to be occupied by the British military, into which no Americans were allowed, and that area was to remain unavailable for an inde indeterminate period of time. When the British say the Balkans, they basically mean Yugoslavia, and Yugoslavia had the entire coastline along the eastern side of the Adriatic Sea across from Italy, beginning at the port of Trieste at the top of Italy's boot. Fodor's Yugoslavia 1973 said that the country was part Vienna and part v Venetian sea power and part Ottoman Empire, and that in the spring one can ski in the mountains and swim in the ocean on the same day, and that they recommend the coast in the summer because the inland cities can become too hot. Holiday-wise, the sleepy sun-soaked siesta of a Dalmatian beach contrasts with a motor trip over the lovely mountain roads of Macedonia, or a journey by raft down the turbulent waters of the Drina River. Fodor's Yugoslavia, 1973, page 69. The head of looting Jews in Germany was a man named Odilo Globochnik part Russian and part Austrian, and he had been regularly fired personally by Hitler for arresting innocent people just to get their money. The Tarvizio Trieste Railroad was 40 miles from Odilo's hometown of Tarvizio in the mountains of Slovenia near the border with Austria, and the railroad to Trieste had been built after the lesson learned in the War of the Spanish Succession, when France had too much power in northern Italy and could blockade the Austrians sailing in and out of the port of Trieste, and so they had built the railroad that gave the Austrians some freedom over not having to go to war with France again. The Yugoslav army, led by Tito, marched into Trieste on the 1st of May in 1945, and the British arrived one day later, and there were already 5,000 Americans and 5,000 British troops around the lovely port of Trieste, and while 7,000 German soldiers were there waiting for orders, and they had been there since the beginning of the war. The Yugoslavs agreed to back up 12 miles, and the British would send their foremost military official on the 7th of May, General Sir W. D. Morgan, and he would draw a blue line for Tito, who told Morgan that the damn war was over and that he should go home, because the days were past that the British could take the train from Greece to Trieste to Silesia without being stopped by Russian customs inspectors dressed in Russian army uniforms. Morgan agreed instead to meet with Tito in Belgrade that was 350 miles away from Trieste, and the British were insisting that they needed to keep Trieste as a communication line to their British forces in Austria via the trieste Tarvizio Railroad. Morgan told Tito he was willing to leave the Vienna to Trieste Railroad in the hands of the Yugoslavs if they agreed to let the British keep the railway to Tarvizio. Morgan had fought at the Battle of Mons in the Great War, and he had now holed up in the Duino, Duino Castle in Trieste because the Americans had chased the British out of the Miramar Castle, and the deal was that the railroad from Trieste to Austria through northern Yugoslavia would be left in the capable hands of Tito, while the British were given the automobile road to Frankfurt along the Drava River, on which they could drive right over the mountains to Berchtesgaden by following the exquisitely turquoise Isonzo River up from Trieste to its headwaters and then drive down the Russian road built during the Great War by 10,000 Russian POWs through the Julian Alps in 1916 over Wershitz Pass with its dozens of switchbacks and from there right on over the Austrian border. 
Tito had been born in Croatia, one mile away from the border with Slovenia. And Tito's father had been a bad drunk and a gambler who would send the young Tito around to beg off his debts. And Tito had dreamed of coming to America when he was a boy, and he'd become a soldier and fought for Austria on the Russian front during the Great War. Tito had been wounded and captured, and when the Russians went red, Tito had been a prisoner for two years, and he was freed by the Red Army. Tito had fallen in love with a Russian girl and married her, and he went back to the Balkans and worked as a metal worker and a machinist, and he joined the Communist Party and was arrested in 1928 for passing out communist literature in Yugoslavia. Tito was put in jail for five years while his wife went back to Russia for her safety, and Tito was released from prison at age 41 and he became a Soviet spy, and Tito learned to use disguises and other secret stuff, and in 1940 he became head of the party at the age of 49. In June of 1943, Tito's 20,000 soldiers were surrounded by 120,000 German and Italian troops, but two-thirds of the Yugoslavs escaped across the Drina River. And after that clear miracle in the Balkan land of miracles, where the Virgin Mary had appeared at Metagorgia, Tito became a major hero, and the common people loved him for calling the rich folks Nazi collaborators, which they were and everyone wanted to join up with him. When Tito became the leader of Yugoslavia, he only allowed one political party that he thought represented the people, and after the horror of Hitler's war, few could argue with that. Tito looked a lot like Stalin, and they had the same rank, but Tito's health was not very good after Hitler's war because he'd been hiding out in the cold for so long. Tito became the power in Yugoslavia after the war, and he was strong enough to stand up to Stalin himself, and at first Tito had tried to get along with the British, but quickly turned around to seek help from Moscow to keep the British out of the Balkans. Tito had shot down two U.S. planes in 1946 just to prove he was willing to do it. And Stalin sent plenty of advisors and an unlimited supply of vodka to Yugoslavia, but the alcohol angered Tito after what he'd been through with his father, so Tito kept Moscow at arm's length. Tito accomplished state socialism, and the economic miracle he managed was no simple achievement after what the Nazis and the British had done to Yugos Yugoslavia. The Nazis had come into the Balkans in April of 1941 as soon as Kim Philby told Stalin about Churchill's plans to invade Yugoslavia right after the British set up a base in Greece. And Stalin had told Hitler because they had still been on friendly terms in Poland. And when the British bombed Belgrade back into the Stone Age, Tito and his ardent followers headed for the hills, and with them went Yugoslavian women in uniform. After Hitler's war, the Soviets went to work making movies for the big silver screen to tell the story of how and why they had won the Great Patriotic War. And they had plenty of uniforms and helmets and guns and tanks left for use for authentic props, and the Great Cold War prevented most of those films from being seen in the West yet. Although American audience audiences found more in common with Russian movies than with British or French films, Russian movies about the war were clean and straightforward, while cinema telling the story of the other side has yet to be made. Before the war, the British had pulled out of the Pacific to fight in the Mediterranean, and that had left the Americans busy fighting Japan, and the plan had been that as soon as the Russians were defeated by Germany in Barbarossa, the British Balkan adventure would begin in earnest, but the Russians had beat back the invading Germans, and the Americans had begun to win against the Japanese, and the V-1 rockets unleashed on London had failed to bring about the expected capitulation. Those V-1 wonder weapons launched from right across the street from British spy headquarters in the Netherlands. Unable to leverage a separate peace while Russia and America were beginning to win the war, 
Churchill had turned instead to working on plans that would salvage what he could and squirrel away a war chest for the next round of global warfare, beginning in another twenty years or less. Of course, there was still the possibility that the V-2 rockets could win the war, but the whole plan had become less and less the sure thing it had seemed on the drawing board. And as the men and munitions coming forth from America and from Russia increased month by month, Churchill's hopes of a friendly limited battle between brother Aryans became increasingly less likely to end well. The projected separate peace between Germany and Britain had seemed like a certainty because Stalin had purged most of his trained generals, with three out of five of his senior officers either dismissed or outright murdered, and not only those with ties to Britain, but any having an interest in Poland or in Germany, and these purges had been helped along by information given to him by the British Kim Philby. With the Chamberlain Pact, Hitler had been allowed to build ships in the port of Danzig so he could beat the Russians, and Germany had been making friends in Turkey to keep Russia away from Constantinople. And the Danube River ran downstream from Austria, right through Belgrade, where Tito had asked to meet with Morgan. And as the Danube moved through Yugoslavia and then downstream into Romania, it emptied into the Black Sea eighty miles south of Odessa, the Black Sea was 170,000 square miles in an area roughly 300 miles long by 600 miles wide, and the Strait of Constantinople led out of its western side to link the motherland with the Mediterranean. Russia was on the north side of the Black Sea, and Turkey comprised the entire south shore, and directly to the east, 200 miles from where the Danube poured itself into the Black Sea, Sevastopol in the Crimea was across the water on the Russian side. After sailing through the Strait of Constantinople, Greece was on the Mediterranean side of Turkey, and after sailing west through the innumerable Greek islands, the Adriatic Sea headed north up to the lovely port of Trieste, 700 miles away by sea. From Trieste, one could drive up to reach Vienna, but by far the easier route was sailing the Danube all the way to Austria. The Adriatic was only 100 miles wide from the coast of Italy to the coast of Yugoslavia, and using the Danube to travel from Turkey to Vienna was a much faster route, especially with the railroad, and Belgrade was built on the Danube 100 miles downstream from the Hungarian border, and Bal Belgrade was the heart of Tito's territory. Hungary's capital, Budapest, was 100 miles downstream from Bratislava, and Vienna was 30 miles upriver from Bratislava, and on the 9th of October in 1943, unknown guerrilla forces had opened an offensive against German troops around Trieste. The murdering in the towns around the Verschitz Pass had been exceptionally horrifying, and the British had helped this militia murder 400 men right away, while the serious mass killing would begin the week after Market Garden failed in September of 1944. At first, in October of 1943, 135 locals were forced to kneel and were shot in the back of the head and their bodies were piled on wagons and taken to the dump, and the author of this account called Genocide Carried Out by Tito Partisans, from the Austrian Historian Working Group for Karnten and Steiermark, translated by Henry Fisher, edited and published by Jody McKim, September 2006, said that the gypsies had cheered on the killing and had jumped on the wagons going to the dump and played their accordions while the militia were singing along. The author of Genocide Carried Out by Tito Partisans wrote this article for an anti-Russia audience and blaming Tito at the time had been in vogue while the actual militia around the Verschitz Pass in 1943 could have been any anonymous historian's guess, while those with actual knowledge of the events can be assumed to have not dared to say. 
According to the eyewitness author of The Forgotten 500, who also wrote Sailors to the End, The Deadly Fire on the USS Forrestal and the Heroes Who Fought It, there had been hundreds of American pilots shot down over Yugoslavia that were being sheltered by the Chetniks, and Churchill had the Chetniks declared enemy collaborators at Tehran in December of 1943. Under Churchill's orders, all Americans giving assistance to the Chetniks had to leave northern, northern Yugoslavia by October of 1944, and on the 23rd of October in 1944, the 35 leading members of the community around Wershitz Pass were put in jail and tortured for days and then murdered, and the 250 German POWs being held were taken outside town and shot and buried in ditches, and by November there was nobody left in the region who did not hold allegiance to this anonymous militia and their British handlers. Odilo Globochnik had been sent to Trieste to be the Nazi governor of the region, and he had started out as the Nazi governor of Vienna when the German army first marched into Austria for the Anschluss in the spring of 1938. And Odilo had been sent from Vienna to Poland to supervise the Jewish gold gathering at the Polish camps. And when Hitler fired him for stealing, Himmler had Odilo transferred to Trieste where he became the new police chief for the entire Adriatic coast. Odilo could arrest anyone he wanted and steal everything they owned with no questions asked, and Hitler had found out that Odilo was still in charge in Poland after Hitler had fired him the first time, and so Hitler ordered that Odilo be sent away somewhere where he could do, do no more harm. But Odilo had been the best money maker for the SS. Himmler had ever found, and so Odilo was transferred to the lovely port of Trieste, coming home to where he had been born and raised, just in time for the final scene of the war. The intentional murder of Jews, instead of using them for labor, was called Operation Reinhard, after Reinhard Heydrich, Heydrich Jitsch, who had been murdered in May of 1942, although some historians said it was named after the Secretary of State Fritz Reinhardt in the Ministry of Finance, who had been the customs and tax advisor. The bank account used to deposit money stolen from the extermination camp victims was called Reinhardt's Fund, and it was this bank account of Fritz Reinhardt that was used by the Nazis to pay for all their construction projects and to pay the salaries of the people operating the extermination camps. Odilo had been the construction supervisor during the building of the first concentration camps, and he personally contributed to the design of the murder camps built solely for extermination purposes. And Operation Reinhard ran from the beginning of 1942 to October of 1943, when it was shut down and their three main facilities at Treblinka, Belzic, and Sobibor were destroyed, even grinding up the bone fragments left in the ashes, and the staff and guards were sent to Trieste with Odilo. Operation Reinhardt had been closed down as soon as the Americans signed an agreement with the Italians at Cassibile on the 8th of September in 1943, while the U.S. Army was still in occupation of Sicily. Signing that agreement allowed Ike to cancel the 500 RAF bombers waiting on the runway with their orders to bomb Rome. And as soon as the Italians signed the armistice of Cassibile with the Americans in September of 1943, the Germans had to move into Italy in force, so resources were stripped away from Operation Reinhard and the barbed wire was sent to Italy. The German army quickly occupied Italy's entire boot, except for Sardinia and Apulia, where the British were entrenched and Apulia was in the heel of the boot on the Italian side of the entrance to the Adriatic Sea. The death camp operators who came to Trieste with Odilo were experienced exterminators, and they set up shop at San Saba that had been an old rice mill they converted into a prison. 
and a majority of those 100 specialists were Ukrainian SS soldiers. San Saba immediately received trainloads of Italians accused of betraying the Reich, and Odilo attached a custom-built crematorium onto the side of the building at San Saba, and within a year he had gathered a small army of his own, perhaps 3,500 men, who called themselves the Slovenian National Defense Corps, and they made themselves a patch that was a Viking ship with a flag flying and oars in the water. In the beginning, Hitler had given Odilo millions of dollars to spend on the military defense of Poland, but Odilo had put it into his own bank account instead, and that was what had allowed the Russians to march so easily into Silesia. After the war, for every 30 Germans who were taken prisoner by Russia, only one would come back home, and as the war was winding down in 1945, Odilo and a dozen SS soldiers loaded up all the stolen Jewish gold and put it onto trucks, and they drove into the Austrian mountains, 100 miles above Trieste, just north of the border between Italy and Yugoslavia. And so it didn't matter that Tito had blocked the railroad to Austria, because the road left to the British was more than adequate for the task. They buried the gold there in five different places before the British made Odilo their guest in May of 1945, and the British marched towards Morgan's Blue Line on the 22nd of May, trying to provoke a response from Tito, but the Soviet Yugoslavs kept their heads, and Tito built a blue train so he could ride around Yugoslavia in style for the foreseeable future. Trieste would be put under the authority of the UN until it became a free territory in February of 1947, and when the Americans interviewed, interviewed the Gestapo chief about Odilo Globochnik, the chief said, Q. Initially, he gave his British army captors a very large amount of British paper money to let him go. Chief Muller, My God, paper pounds! He gave them these to save his life? Q. No, these were good notes that he got at the Lublin camps. The British soldiers took the money, of course, Chief Muller. Naturally they did. Why didn't they take the money and then kill him out of hand? That would be more their style. He could have been shot while trying to escape, or he would have committed suicide while eating dinner full of poison. Q. No, they did spare him, but they didn't get that much more, and Globochnik is not an easy person to deal with, Chief Muller. A swine of the worst sort, believe me, a criminal and a thug. Then what happened to him? Q. The British became very nervous about him and his associate, whom they found in Hamburg, and decided to get rid of them by turning them over to us in exchange for some documents we had located in Germany. Chief Muller. Documents? May I ask what kind of documents? Q. Concerning correspondence between a certain famous member of the British royal family and Hitler, Chief Muller. Ha! Ah! the Duke of Windsor's papers. Would you like to see photocopies of these? I have them put away. Q. No, we gave them, as I understand, the originals, or at least some of them, and then gave, and they gave us Globochnik and Wirth, Chief Muller. Oh, my God, you must be joking with me. I know who Wirth was, and he was killed during the war, war, an SS major. You can't tell me that one survived, can you? I was, I saw the reports on that. Are you talking about Christian Wirth? He would be in his late fifties or early sixties by now. He worked in the camp system, but before that he was at Hadamar, the sanitarium where they killed the hopelessly sick idiots and the feeble-minded. That worth? Q. I believe so. Chief Muller. I'm certain he was killed. Q. Confirmed? Chief Muller. As I remember, he was supposed to have been killed in a fight with partisans. What happened then? Q. I'm not fully briefed on this, but I understand he realized what would happen to him, so he vanished, like a number of others whose names come to mind. Chief Muller. Yes, I'm sure they do. Well, now who was this monkey? You? Q. The problem is that the British passed them off on our people as experts in partisan warfare. Chief Muller. Nonsense. They are a pair of real murderers, not partisan fighters. That's typical British double-dealing for you. If you can't swindle your enemies, try your allies. Now what is the problem? Not that I can't see it. If anyone finds out about that pair, your government will be boiled in oil in the press. 
I, at least, never slaughtered hundreds of thousands of Jews. Didn't you check them out? Q. It was all done on a very high level, and we had no knowledge of it until lately. I think the CIC has its hands full with this, this issue. Chief Muller. Well, don't touch e either of them. Take my advice and shoot them both quietly and bury them in the woods. Q. Unfortunately, there is still the money matter. The money is needed, and Globochnik has been turning up just enough of it to preserve his skin. Chief Muller. I don't suppose you should... I should ask you why you want the money. Q. Well, what did the SS do with the counterfeit British money? Chief Muller. Probably the same thing you're doing, keeping some of it safe for retirement and using the rest for intelligent intelligence operation that don't bear scrutiny by self-righteous bureaucrats. Q. Exactly. Gestapo Chief, page 91 and 2. The British would claim that Odilo killed himself with a cyanide pill, a story not believed by anyone who knew him personally, and the British would maintain that they buried Odilo's body and had forgotten its location, while the rest of the world was too busy clearing away the rubble to wonder about one more of so many dead Nazis. In 1983, some official documents would be dug up revealing not only that Odilo had survived, but that he had helped make a list of the booty captured by the British during his arrest in Austria. And the list included 12,000 kilos of gold and silver wedding rings, 6,000 gold pocket watches, 8,000 Austrian gold coins, 13,000 gold crucifixes, 40,000 Russian gold coins, 15,000 Austrian gold coins, 5,000 American gold coins, 5,000 kilos of gold scrap and British gold sovereigns, and 5,000 kilos of dental gold with parts of teeth and jawbones still attached, all carefully listed under the watchful eyes of Odilo. There were also piles of cash, including $300,000 in U.S. gold notes, and there were countless kilos of jewelry, precious stones, and heirloom table tableware all detailed on page 10 of the September 1991 issue of Lost Treasure magazine. The Americans were handed a copy of this list of Odilo's treasure held by the British in exchange for a Yugoslavian passport for Odilo, and when the Americans called later in 1948, they were told by Odilo that the list was accurate, but that some items had been left out by the British. And in light of Odilo's information, the U.S. Treasury decided not to go back on the gold standard after the war, but to let the dollar float free on its own merit. When Morgan had been trying to occupy Trieste in the final week of Hitler's war, the British had tried to get the Americans to march into Austria in hopes of frightening away the Russians, but Ike wasn't buying. The British had cooked up a claim that Hitler was planning to flee to the Austrian mountains with what remained of the German army for one last ugly fight in the impassable mountains, hoping the Americans would get to Austria before the Russians, but Ike ordered Patton to stand fast. Months before... G2 had tipped us off to a fantastic enemy plot for the withdrawal of troops into the Austrian Alps where weapons, stores, and even aircraft plants were reported cached for a last-ditch holdout. There the enemy would presumably attempt to keep alive the Nazi myth until the Allies grew tired of occupying the Reich, or until they fell out among themselves. Bradley, page 523. Not until the campaign ended were we to learn that this readout existed largely in the imaginations of a few fanatic Nazis. It grew into so exaggerated a scheme that I am astonished we could have believed it as innocently as we did. Bradley Ibid The readout was finally dismissed as a fake story when Lieutenant General Kurt Dittmar, a German radio commentator known as the Voice of the Wehrmacht, pulled across the Elbe in a small boat to surrender to the Ninth Army. When queried by G2, Dittmar insisted he had not heard of the redoubt until January 1945, when he read of it in a Swiss paper. Bradley, page 524. 23 August, 1944. 
It was a fantastic scheme to create an all-British front in Italy by removing all American forces from Italy to France and replacing them by British forces drawn from France. This all-British force was then to proceed through northern Italy and through the Ljubljana Alps to the capture of Vienna. War Diaries, Allenbrook, page 584. What had happened was that the British had trapped a major Russian spy, and Philby, with his agent's inbuilt danger detector, knew that he was no longer safe. The spy the British had uncovered was George Blake, an SIS agent who had been working for the Russians for nearly ten years. Blake had been betrayed by the chief of Polish intelligence. We are able to reveal for the first time that Philby arrived on Russian soil four days after he left Beirut, i.e., on January 27, 1963. As to his exact route, it would appear that Philby was driven to the Syrian border in a Turkish truck and crossed using forged papers, identifying him as a Turkish, Turkish diplomatic courier. He made his way across Syria into Turkey. From there, using his knowledge of the country gained during his earlier periods there and his contacts with Armenians, which he had built up in Cyprus, he walked into Soviet Armenia. Then, feeling safe for the first time in thirty years, he quote-unquote went home to Moscow. The Philby Conspiracy, page 288 and 90. The footnote read, Blake was sentenced to forty-two years jail but escaped from Wormwood Scrubs Prison, London, on October 22, 1966, and is, at the time of, at the time of writing, living in Russia. The Red Army had gone into Poland on the 17th of September in 1939, and there had been friendly cooperation between the Russians and the Germans, which didn't work out so well for the Poles. And on the first day of the invasion of Poland, the Germans bombed most of the Poles' airplanes and the German infantry rode motorcycles, and they went so fast that it was called Blitzkrieg, and the last authentic cavalry charge in history was the Polish cavalry charging in 1939 against the new mechanized German army. A cavalry charge induces a form of madness. Riders and horses alike are infected. Its fury, its weight, and its pounding impetus can only be stopped by the most awful and concentrated gunfire. The Germans who stood up to surrender were mown down. The cavalry in a charge cannot take prisoners. The Long Walk by Slavomir Rawitz, as told to Ronald Downing, Ace Books Incorporated, Harper and Brothers Publishers, 1956, page 46. The Russians moved 41 divisions to the west to meet the Germans on the 17th of September, and they shook hands at the agreed borders on the 23rd. So with the naval port of Danzig back in German hands, Hitler moved his favorite ships into the reclaimed port of Danzig so he could engage in exercises at sea with the Royal Navy, and Hitler went on vacation to the Eagle's Nest in Berchtesgaden. Q. In looking at your record, I see you had received the Iron Crosses in 1940. Were you in combat? Chief Muller, no. That was for my work in August and September of 1939, during the Gliwitz business, where Heydrich staged a fake Polish attack on the Gliwitz radio station to give an excuse for the attack on Poland. The date had been changed because Hitler was attempting to negotiate until the last minute, but one group didn't get the cancellation order and began to shoot at a German customs post. I had to go personally into the business and stop the shooting, but this wasn't the Iron Cross. It was a renewal bar for these medals that I got in the 1914 war. Gestapo Chief, page 153 and 4. Poland officially surrendered on the 27th of September in 1939, and the Germans had 20,000 killed and 30,000 wounded, and the Poles suffered 66,000 dead and 130,000 wounded, mostly in aerial bombardment, which horrified Hitler because he'd been told that the civilians were thoroughly warned to evacuate and that all the military bases had also been notified in advance, but there had been a campaign to discredit those sources, and two days later Britain declared war on Germany. The British claimed 
that the swiftness of the German advance had prevented them from intervening directly during the invasion of Poland, and the French had come from the southwest but thought it was a trap and had withdrawn. And despite news releases about Hitler's aggression, no German troops headed towards France after marching into Poland. And for the next eight months, everyone sat around and waited for the war to begin, while an assassination attempt against Hitler failed on the 8th of November in 1939, thirty days after the invasion of Poland, and the following spring on the 9th of April in 1940, Denmark and Norway did not rise up to join the British landing parties in Scandinavia. As soon as Monty's Goodwood failed in 1944, the Russians began an offensive into Poland on the 20th of June, and the day after the Red Army liberated Majdanek in Poland on the 24th of July, Himmler was appointed commander-in-chief of the Reserve Army, and Goebbels was appointed plenipotentiary for total war. In Poland, Warsaw began an uprising against the Nazis on the 1st of August, while the Russians were paused outside the city limits, and Churchill begged Eich to intervene, but Eich was busy welcoming Patton into Normandy after Patton's exile in England. The Warsaw Uprising began with a flood of newspaper headlines and news bulletins and radio broadcasts before it started and the RAF parachuted 150 Polish commandos into Warsaw who had been trained in London, and the RAF made over 200 flights that dropped 4,000 containers of weapons and supplies and cold hard cash into the city. After the uprising began, Churchill sent another 200 supply drops to the Poles of War Warsaw, half of which ended up in German hands, while Stalin waited to see if the Americans were good for their word that the British would not be allowed to take over Poland. Churchill sent a telegram to FDR on the 25th of August that said the Allies should send forces into Warsaw in defiance of Stalin to simply, quote, see what happens, close quote. And FDR cabled back the next day, I do not consider it advantageous to the long-range general war prospect for me to join you. The Russians opposed the British attempt to keep Warsaw out of the Soviet sphere, and after the war, Stalin wanted to import defeated Germans into Russia to rebuild his battered country, and after a few weeks of the uprising, Stalin allowed the Americans to use Soviet landing fields to drop food and medicine into Warsaw, until over 90% of the airdrops had fallen into German territory, at which point Stalin took over the supply drops himself. The Warsaw ups Uprising had coincided with the uprisings in Paris at the same time. And the day Market Garden failed a month later, on the 25th of September, the Germans began launching over 3,000 V-2 rockets that would continue for the next six months. And that same day, on the 25th of September, the Home Guard was called up in Germany. The Poles had risen up against enormous odds on the 1st of August, and on the 2nd of October, the Warsaw Uprising was crushed, and it had helped that the British had not taken into consideration that so many of the Poles fighting in the uprising had wanted Poland to be given to the Soviets, and thus coordination had broken down among the British planners. The claim had been that the Warsaw Uprising had been a spontaneous outbreak from the native inhabitants of Warsaw, and that the British had only wanted to fly humanitarian aid into the city, but they also wanted to send in the Polish government in exile that they had been keeping in London. Britain was emboldened by the absence of any Polish soldiers left in Warsaw who could oppose the British invasion after four years of Nazi occupation, and Stalin knew better, knew better than to get in the way of the British operation because Stalin knew from Kim Philby that there were not nearly enough forces being sent into Warsaw to eject the Germans and that the Americans were not going to be arriving in Poland and that all Stalin had to do was wait for the Warsaw Uprising to fizzle out because he had a friend in the White House. The Nazis retreated from Warsaw after destroying as much of it as they could, and when the Soviets marched into the city, 
There were only ten thousand shivering poles where left where the summer before there had been one million. And the Russians taught the Poles how to set up neighborhood Soviets and how to live in peace under their new democratic government. After reaching Germany, Stalin paused again to see how the Battle of the Bulge would work out. And when his friend FDR died in April of 1945, the Red Army went for broke towards Berlin on the 16th of April with Ike's full permission. The Johnson Act of 1934 had barred the U.S. from making loans to countries that had defaulted on obligations to America, and the U.S. Neutrality Act of 1939 made it possible to do business with countries warring with one another if both sides were given the same amount of munitions and food. But with the declaration of war against Germany the day after Pearl Harbor, the lines were clearly drawn, and Stalin's Soviet Union would come out the winner when Germany's last attempt to keep back the Red Army with Hitler's Operation Spring Awakening ran into Tito. At the end of Hitler's war, okay. Stalin's Soviet Union would come out the winner when Germany's last attempt to keep back the Red Army with Hitler's Operation Spring Awakening ran, in, ran into Tito. At the end of Hitler's war, the U.S. had three times the industrial capacity of Russia and ten times that of Britain, and the devastation in Russia was immense, with 26 million of their people killed and 1,700 towns and 70,000 farming villages destroyed, and 30,000 factories and 6 million buildings had been blown up along with 60 major power plants and 3,000 oil wells. In Russia, the Germans had killed 20 million cows, hogs, and sheep each, and as the Germans retreated from Russia, they had torn up 35,000 miles of railroad tracks, hoping to slow the coming payback as the Russians began moving towards Berlin. When Ike came to meet with the Russian army occupying Berlin, he was surprised by the amount of ox-drawn wagons the Red Army had brought with them, and the U.S. promised to stay in Berlin after the war to protect the Germans from the British, and denazification programs would be run by Americans. Civilian officials friendly to the Americans suffered a plague of clandestine assassinations in many German towns, especially in Hanover purportedly done by Nazis, but certainly not by anyone in a recognizable uniform. Hitler's decision to form a great offensive against the tempting thinly line, thin, thinly held front of the Ardennes, the scene of his 1940 victory, had one unexpected result. It delayed a planned Allied offensive and thus permitted the Russians to launch their attacks to the Oda River against greatly weakened opposition and advance farther into Germany. Had Hitler sent his mobile reserve to the east rather than into the Ardennes, it is entirely possible that the Western Allies and Russians would have met somewhere in Poland, the Bitter Woods, page 469.